In September of 2015, Moscow sent contingents of the Russian military to Syria to intervene in the Syrian civil war on behalf of President Bashar al-Assad's government. The so-called dictator president of Syria was under attack from rebels, aided by the United States, and Moscow saw it as an opportunity to advance their foreign policy agenda. What followed were brutal years of war, with brutal consequences that shaped the Middle East in ways that we are still yet to fully understand. Much like Ukraine, the United States and the West supported one side, and Russia supported the other. Russian airstrikes over Syria, a new round tonight. Now to the latest on the crisis in Syria. As U.S. troops continue to pull back, Russia is moving in. It's been a game-changing couple of weeks in international relations over Syria. So many questions arise in this conflict. Why did Russia intervene in Syria? Why was Syria undergoing a civil war? And what has Moscow stood to benefit from its involvement in the Middle East? Maybe even most importantly, how were Moscow's actions back then crucial to its current war with Ukraine? These are all questions that I'll answer in this video as we explore Russia's brutal attack on Syria. As we get into the subject, please take a moment to hit like on this video. Your likes help me a lot as they offset the suppression that topics like this get from the YouTube algorithm. These war and political topics, however, are crucial topics that I know you want to learn more about. So your likes will help validate all the effort that goes into making these videos. Okay, now back to the basics. To understand this story better, we have to start not in Syria, but in Tunisia, where one lone boy and his wheelbarrow of fresh vegetables were the dominoes that changed the entire Middle Eastern landscape. You see, on December 17th, 2010, a young Tunisian boy named Mohamed Bouazizi, who sold vegetables from a barrel, set himself afire to protest against police harassment. At that time, there was unrest in Tunisia, and in the absence of a good judicial system, general police harassment had escalated, as it often does. Although Mohamed met his death on January 4th, less than a month later, his actions echoed. The conviction and the pain that so many felt but had never been able to verbalize, was carried through his actions. And that sparked the embers of a revolt across Tunisia. The riots and protests that were started in his name grew so explosively that in just under two weeks, Tunisia's authoritarian president, Zini el Abdin bin Ali, had fled the nation. He abdicated to Saudi Arabia, abandoning a 23-year-old reign over the nation. Bin Ali's actions led him to become the first leader of an Arab nation to be pushed out by popular protests. But due to the wave of fire that he had just started, he would not be the last. As other citizens of countries that were oppressed by dictators realized that it was possible to not be subjected to the harsh realtors of pain and poverty, a wave of defiance began to spread. That very month, Egyptians started protesting in the capital city of Cairo in numbers, and they had only one demand. The 30-year-old dictator leader, President Hosni Mubarak, had to go. And sure enough, as the protest intensified, Mubarak was left with no choice but to resign and step down. This was barely two weeks since his citizens had taken to the street. Egypt's dictatorial collapse empowered the movement that then spilled over to Bahrain and Libya. And these two countries, particularly Libya, things took a very violent and dark twist, and the riots turned into a full civil war. While we're still on the subject, Libya's case was as well, for lack of a better word, interesting. I can make a whole video on the collapse of Gaddafi's Libya and American involvement in the matter. Just let me know in the comment section below if that's something that you'd be interested, and I will deliver. But moving on. Libya's saga also ended with the death of Gaddafi on October 20th, 2011. The rebels had won and defeated the national troops and president. This marked an unprecedented move that showed that with enough support, in direct conflict, a government could lose a war to rebel groups. This is where our story takes us to Syria. Syria, much like many Middle Eastern nations, was in the same position. President Bashar al-Assad had been the nation's ruler since 2000. What made his case even more tragic is that he had succeeded his father, Hafez al-Assad, who himself had ruled Syria since 1971. It was a family dynasty of sorts, and unfortunately, it was not a well-liked one. Bashar al-Assad had largely continued his father's authoritarian methods and 
in certain ways, he was worse. This is why when the flames of change began burning through the Middle East, Bashar al-Assad knew his head was on the chopping block. It was inevitable. You could also argue that the Arab Spring came at a time when Syria was already struggling. Between 2006 and 2010, Syria experienced the worst drought in the country's modern history. Hundreds of thousands of farming families were reduced to poverty, causing a mass migration of rural people into urban shanty towns. The hunger and struggle that the masses were experiencing made the whole situation that much more unbearable, to the point where discontent was all but inevitable. What set off the flames in his country was when about 12 teenagers tagged the wall of their school in southern Syria with the words, Your turn, doctor, referring to President Bashar al-Assad, a trained ophthalmologist. They were insinuating that after Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, and others, it was his turn to step down. Perhaps it was the fact that the tensions were already high and everyone was on edge, that the soldiers in the region took it as an act of complete defiance and so they decided to retaliate, harshly. Those teenagers were tortured, and that was the act that turned what had been up until then peaceful protests into militant ones. Syria's protests on the back of their tortured youths overnight turned into a civil war. Given what I mentioned regarding the drought, it is perhaps not surprising that it was in the impoverished, drought-stricken rural providence of Dara'a in southern Syria that the first major protests occurred in March of 2011. A starving population is a dangerous population. Every leader knows that. And if Assad didn't, well, he quickly found out. What began as a peaceful uprising against the president in Syria nearly 10 years ago turned into a full-scale civil war. The conflict in Syria continues to claim lives. More than 100,000 people have died, and the brutal math does not stop there. 1,000 bloody days since the Syrian civil war first began. The UN estimates over 100,000 have been killed. By the end of 2011, Syria was undergoing not just a general civil war, but a painfully organized one. Various rebel militias had popped up and were fighting the government troops in an organized fashion all over Syria. One of the key forces of the resistance was the Free Syrian Army. This was a rebel militia that was made up of defectors from the Syrian army. For a while, they were the main face of the resistance as they launched assault after assault on the government troops along with other resistance groups. Surprisingly, or maybe unsurprisingly, kind of depending on which side of the fence you were on, these rebel groups were doing very well. They pushed the government forces back to the point where they were forced to withdraw from key positions, thereby allowing the rebels to gain territory in key areas. The rebels even launched an offensive on Aleppo, Syria's largest city, allowing them to have a significant foothold in the eastern part of the city. The Syrian civil war continued in this fashion into 2013. But this is when both sides started to strain under the pressures of war. On one hand, the rebel militias were severely undersupplied, and with no access to weapons and funding, they were starting to lose a hold on the sectors they had previously won. On the other hand, the government forces were suffering from massive defections. The hardest people to fight against are your own people, especially when they are making good points, and this logic is what resulted in a lot of soldiers deserting the army to join the opposition, and this weakened serious forces. This scenario, where the two sides were almost desperate for a boost, allowed those in the international community, who up until that point had been all talk, to take part. This is where Russia and the rest come in. Just give it a second. You see, nations like Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar were very anti-Assad, and the idea of his dictatorship flourishing in the Middle East wasn't in their best interests. In this regard, they started to fund and arm rebel troops in the hope that the rebels would emerge as the victors of the Syrian war. The scenario was made even worse when the Syrian government was suspected of having used chemical weapon attacks in the suburbs of Damascus, an attack that killed hundreds of citizens. The Syrian opposition accused pro-Assad forces of having carried out the attacks, while the Assad regime vehemently denied them. Regardless of that, it allowed many nations to band together against Syria. The United States was at the top of that list. Up until then, the US had been a very vocal critic of Assad's government, and suddenly also had an opportunity to intervene. 
the US started a program where they would train and equip a few rebel groups, enabling them to be more of a threat to government troops. With them receiving proper funding from Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar, while also receiving military training from the US, Syria's civil war started to look in favor of the rebels. Bashar was on the ropes, and with things turning dark for him, he started to look for friends too. This friend came in the form of Russia. Russia and Syria had long since shared ties since the days of the Soviet Union. In those times, the Soviet Union was supplying Syria with aid and arms in a bid to increase its influence in the Middle East. However, when the Soviet Union fell, so too did its influence in Syria. When Putin became president of Russia in 2000, it was the same year that Bashar al-Assad took over from his father as well. As Vladimir Putin began his ambitious expansion of Russian military and Russian influence, the relationship between Russia and Syria started getting rekindled. So, in 2015, when Putin received a formal request from Bashar to assist, it was a perfect opportunity. Russia saw that by getting involved, they could benefit in two ways. On one hand, they could benefit from having Syria's government indebted to them. This would allow for an upper hand in various dealings, as we will soon see in a couple of minutes. On the other hand, the conflict provided Russia with a platform to be able to test out the capabilities of its newly expanded military. The fact that the US was training the enemies of Russia was an even better advantage because Russia could compare its capabilities to its biggest rival and learn from them. In short, Syria became a proxy war for Russia, Iran, the United States, and several other countries. With all this going for it, Russia began to take a more active role in the conflict. Pentagon says that Russian fighter jets have now arrived in Syria. The last few days also show Russian helicopters, transport aircraft, tanks, and armored personnel carriers. We are getting new information into the newsroom that Russia has just launched a round of airstrikes against ISIS in Syria. Moscow deployed troops and military equipment to an airbase near Latakia, and they launched an offensive from there. As Russia began raining hellfire on various targets in Syria, the message was that Russia was targeting ISIL and ISIS terrorists that had emerged in the region. Of course, this was a facade, and soon it was revealed that Russia was mostly bombing rebels fighting against Assad as they lent help to their ally. This moved the West to fund the rebels even more, with the US and Britain having parliamentary debates on whether or not they themselves should put boots on the ground. Despite the heavy opposition, Russia did not back down, and it continued to support its ally with weaponry, soldiers, and funding. Russia was determined to win this proxy war, and together with Iran, which was also funding and equipping the Syrian government, it became increasingly possible that they were going to. What made the Russian involvement very scary is that the Russians, along with the Syrian government forces, did not attempt at all to avoid causing civilian casualties. If anything had a chance to subdue the rebels, then it was a go. Of course, for Russia, the implication was much less, because these weren't their people. But for Bashar, it only made him even more hated, with the West accusing him of crimes against humanity, against his own people. In their bombing campaigns, Russian and Syrian warplanes dropped indiscriminate munitions, such as cluster bombs and incendiary bombs, and targeted medical facilities, search and rescue teams, and aid workers. Those actions were condemned by human rights groups, but they continued unabated until the rebels in Aleppo collapsed. It was an effective strategy, but an inhumane one, as thousands of innocent people lost their lives. But that's the thing with power, isn't it? Once you have a taste of it, you would do anything to never relinquish it. This, I assume, was the thinking behind Bashar's drastic actions. Once Russia liberated Aleppo for Bashar, it was victory after victory from there. The rebel forces, overwhelmed by Russian, Iranian, and Syrian forces, started to retreat. This led to a new axis between Russia, Iran, and Turkey, seeking to resolve the Syrian crisis while excluding the West and Arab powers. While the US was hesitant to overstep again to avoid another Iraq incident, Russia had jumped at the opportunity, and now Putin had the opportunity to control not just the narrative, but the entire dynamic of the Middle East. It's crucial to realize that this is one of the many benefits that Russia got from intervening in Syria and fighting there. 
by being virtually an unstoppable force of nature on the battleground, Russia gave the rebels no choice but to come to the negotiation table. The West, having seen that the Bashar al-Assad regime was starting to win, now started abandoning the very rebels they had once funded and trained, leaving them to the mercy of elite Russian and Iranian soldiers who hunted them for sport. By coming to the drawing table, Russia managed to establish four de-escalation zones where all sides committed to pausing military activities. This one action removed the burden of fighting on multiple fronts and allowed Syrian government forces, along with their Russian and Iranian allies, to take over one opposition-held area after the other. These actions firmly secured the regime of Bashar in place, and unlike what had happened in the other nations, the Arab Spring never got its goal in Syria. Under the umbrella of Russian dominance, Bashar preserved his dictatorship and virtually eliminated all those who opposed his rule. It became legitimate through force. On Russia's end, its involvement marked a new age of political dominance in the Middle East. Several nations, having just seen how useful having Russia is as an ally, started to improve their own affairs and relations with Russia. The US had been all talk, but Russia had stood by their ally, and that meant something. Nations like Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Egypt, the Kurdistan region of Iraq, Sudan, and Israel have all in recent years paid visits to Moscow to cultivate relationships. This allowed Russia to somewhat dictate terms that have only served to bolster its own political standing further. Other than political standing, Russia benefited economically from immersing itself in the war. You see, when Russia entered the Syrian war, it was going through a big economic crisis that had been propelled by the slumping oil prices and heavy backlash coming from its troubles with the Ukrainian crisis back then. By inserting itself into a war when times were like this, Moscow faced heavy opposition from its own citizens regarding the war. This was something that Moscow quickly proved wrong, as in the years they were in the Syrian conflict, Russia's defense budget dropped from 5.5% of its GDP, which equated to $79 billion in 2016, to 3.7%, which equated to $61.4 billion in 2018. This then alleviated the fears of overspending on the military, allowing Russia to invest in the war with little opposition on the domestic front. An added benefit of Russia's involvement in Syria is that the government got an opportunity to test and promote Russian weaponry on a large scale. This would then create a space to improve Russia's own munitions industry and make them more competitive on a global scale. On that note, it is quite sad that the Middle East had to be the live testing ground of various nations' weaponry. The US for years made Iraq a live testing ammunition ground, something which is sad to consider. Another benefit that Russia received was the fact that the Syrian war boosted the nation's own mercenary business in Russia particularly the Wagner Group associated with Yegivny Prigozhin. This Russian businessman, popularly nicknamed Putin's chef for catering at events attended by the Russian president, has made a fortune, something that has directly resulted in more money in Putin's arsenal. He has been linked to oil and gas deals with Damascus, very lucrative deals that have political strings behind them. The chef was not the only businessman to benefit, however. Several of Putin's associates benefited, with those like Prigozhin and Gennady Temchenko winning some lucrative contracts in Syria, again further increasing the pool of Putin's arsenal fund. Temchenko acquired the right to mine phosphates and operate the port of Tartus, where a $500 million Russian investment had been announced. Coincidence? Yeah, I think not. And as I mentioned before about other Middle Eastern countries coming to be within Russia's influence in recent years, Russia has signed investment pledges and deals worth billions of dollars with them. These nations include Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and Qatar. Russian companies have also acquired lucrative energy contracts in Egypt, Lebanon, and the Kurdistan region of Iraq and Turkey. That's a massive win, I would say, is it not? Another massive win for Russia, perhaps the biggest, comes in the form of the advantage that has been afforded them in Syria in a military capacity. 
Russia says it has installed an S-300 missile system at its naval base in the Syrian port city of Tartus. It has been building up its naval presence near Syria in an effort to keep Western allies out of Syria's bloody civil war. Due to its involvement in the Syrian war in support of Bashar's regime, the president of Syria granted Russia use of the naval facility in Tartus. This port was granted to Russia free of charge for 49 years and it gives the Kremlin sovereign jurisdiction over the base. That means, for all intents and purposes, that base is Russian soil. The Tartus base allows the Russian Navy to avoid dispatching ships to naval installations in the Black Sea for maintenance, as it now has its own facility on a much better route. That reduces Russia's reliance on the West and their allies, something that Putin greatly appreciated. The agreement, which is heavily skewed in Russia's favor, allows Russia to keep a dozen warships, including nuclear-powered vessels, at TARDIS, making it a well-equipped and critical military installation. One that so happens to be the only naval facility the Kremlin possesses outside of the former Soviet Union. Combined with the Himaymim Air Base, which Russia has been using as a base for its air raids in Syria, Russia has a solid military foot in the region. Military assets like them are top-shelf prizes for Russia. Russia's presence in Syria, unlike expected, has not dwindled to zero. What we have to date is the knowledge that Russian troops remain in Syria still. The involvement in the war has been significantly reduced as Bashar's government has the reins now, but Russia remains located in the nation. The friends Russia made in Syria and Iran, specifically, have become Russia's top backers in its current war with Ukraine. Since mid-2022, Iran has become Russia's top military backer. Iran's decision to aid Russia in the war on Ukraine reflected the expanding strategic alliance with Moscow, one that can go on and on given how both countries have similar military objectives. Since August, Iran has provided Russia with hundreds of drones, including the Sahid-136 suicide drone and the Mahajir-6 reconnaissance and strike drone. Iran has also shipped artillery and tank rounds, as well as including some 300,000 artillery shells and 1 million rounds of ammunition via the Caspian Sea. All this has been weaponry that has advanced Russia's agenda in the war, and with Iran continually backing the Kremlin, the war just keeps dragging on longer and longer. Iran has long sought to modernize its military, and on the back of its partnership with Russia, it's finally doing so. It is said that Russia has been offering Iran unprecedented defense cooperation, including on missiles, electronics, and air defense as part of their partnership. Lately, it was reported that Iran could potentially have Russian fighter jets, attack helicopters, radar, and combat trainer aircraft worth billions of dollars, something that threatens geopolitical peace in the Middle East. What we are left with at the end of the day is a military nation called Russia that is advancing its own agenda under the guidance of Putin. The damage we see now in Ukraine is part of the behavior that started long ago. One can wonder if Syria was a practice ground, or if the drills are currently being run in Ukraine. I suppose we'll never know. What remains to be seen is how the government of Bashar will continue cooperating with the Kremlin. And if so, what will come out of this partnership? If you missed the news related to Russian involvement in the Syrian war, that's probably because legacy media companies are not good at covering geopolitical news. And that's why I launched Global Recaps, a geopolitics newsletter that sends important world news directly to your inbox five times a week. Best of all, it's completely free, and you can sign up now by clicking on the link in the description.